Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Today we're going to have a look at the venerable Apple II Plus. Now let me say beforehand, don't expect me to dig into the electronics with a soldering iron because so far I have not been able to find anything wrong with it. Granted, I haven't done any complex tests with it, but uh, I picked this thing up a few months ago and it seems to do what it's supposed to be doing. So we will just have a brief tour of the Apple II. The II Plus was released in 1979. There was, a, there was an Apple I, which was basically a circuit board and a power supply. Then the Apple II came out in this form. That was after uh, Jobs and Wozniak got a lot of money and went out and hired people to build a case, I mean design a case, power supply, and make it more appliance-like than most of its contemporaries, or like uh, the Radio Shack TRS-80. I mean, it came from, the Radio Shack came from a big company, but it had a thin plastic case. And uh, even though it was well beloved, especially by me, as far as being a professional computer, this one looked the part much more. There was also the line of Atari computers, Commodore 64, uh, the TI 994, all of those guys were there, but they. Uh, None of them were as serious about business applications as Apple was. And Apple put a lot of money behind this. And obviously this was a very successful product that actually kept Apple alive throughout the uh, initial introduction of the Macintosh, which wasn't exactly a big success. But they just kept, kept selling tons and tons of these. And I think a good place to start is to have a look at this, at the electrical architecture of it. But to complete the outside, really not much more. This is what it looks like from the side. We have uh, three physical slots here to run cables through to get into the expansion cards. Power connector and power switch. And then we have a composite video output, cassette in and cassette out. And that's about it. Not much else going on. So, let's crack it open and see what's inside. All right, open sesame. And here you go. We have the power supply over here. Apple was uh, one of the first ones to use a switching, switching mode power supply that they had custom designed at first and I think later on Aztec started to build it. But uh, here's the motherboard. Let's see if we can... Well there's a little more stuff hidden over here but nothing too exciting. The real difference here was that it had expansion slot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And up to this time the, the standard for expansion was, a, was the S100 bus. But the S100 bus was really kind of hacky because it gave you access to all the processor signals and but you had to do your own decoding and I don't even know how conflicts were solved at that time I think whenever you bought more than one S100 card you had to read all of the instructions to know exactly what address space each card used and hopefully be able to change address spaces but via dip switches on the cards so that cards wouldn't interfere with each other. And we experienced the same thing in early PC sound cards. 
Some of you may remember whenever you selected a sound card, you had to select the base address, you had to select an IRQ number, and that was, uh, you could change those on the sound cards, but that was because you were the one that had to resolve addressing conflicts, the consumer, which wasn't a very good uh, way to do things, but there really wasn't any other way in the beginning. Then, of course, plug and play came along, and that was a malady on its own, but what Apple did was, uh, instead of, instead of uh, having every card assign an address to itself, they used something called geographical addressing. They assigned 16 contiguous address, addresses, single addresses, to each of the slots, and those are fixed. In addition to that, each slot has a 256-byte ROM space, so that if you need drivers for any of the specific cards, you could put them on the card, and basically the firmware would uh, pull all of the cards, starting from card 8, and then well, really card 7, because it start, the numbering started with 0 on this slot. And what this, this particular one has is it has a disk controller in slot 6 and a language card in slot 0, and we'll talk about what that is. But when you turn on the machine, it basically steps through every slot, starting at slot 7, and checks to see if there's a valid prom. There's valid code in that slot at the fixed geographical space. 256 bytes per card. Now, I don't exactly remember how, to, how they checked for validity of a ROM, but my guess would be that if there was no ROM and they read a couple of address uh, or a couple, some data out of the uh, ROM address space, if it came back as FF, that usually meant that there was nothing in the slot. But if it came back with something more definitive, such as good old hex AA55 or something, then that meant that there was a valid uh, that there was valid code sitting on one of these cards, and execution would be passed off to the initialization entry on that card. And that's the way, for instance, the uh, disk controller card works. It has 256 bytes of PROM on it, or, or, or of uh, executable code, in this PROM and in this PROM. This was, aside of course from the Apple itself, this was uh, Steve Wozniak's second masterpiece, where essentially into 256 bytes he, he was able to fit most of the low-level disk I.O. code, plus of course the boot-up code. So what, what's happened, what happens again is if there's nothing in slot 7 or there's nothing, no memory, no ROM in, in slot 7, when you turn on the Apple, it will execute the code on card number 6. And what that does is it starts up the drive and attempts to read, uh, to read off of that drive. The same principle goes for all of the other slots all the way down to here. And that's the way they uh, and that's the way they handled expansions on this, which was rather ingenious, since uh, since each slot has assigned 16 contiguous addresses plus 256 bytes for ROM code. There was never any conflict. However, somebody of course raised their hand and said, "Wait a minute, 256 bytes." is just, or may just not be enough. Even though Woz was able to fit most of the disk code into here, the low-level disk code, there was a need to provide another way if you needed more ROM on one of these cards. And the way that was done was a single 2K address space was assigned, but it's shared by all of the slots. So at that point, you can never have more than one card in this system that uses that 2K address space. 
Otherwise, you will have conflicts. But uh, that generally tells you about the architecture of it. Other than that, here's a 6502. Everything is socketed in here. There's 12K of firmware that uh, contains BASIC. There's 4K of I.O. space for all the cards, including the 2K of a common memory uh, space in case you need more than 256 bytes for for any one card it has 48k of uh, 48k of uh, DRAM in here there's another row I'm pointing at here that's obscured by this part of the case but uh, these were just 16k 16k by one dynamic dynamic RAMs and then next we can see that one of the dynamic RAMs here is missing but it uses a ribbon cable to plug into this card. This is the so-called language card. It has another 16K on it and uh, what it does in an intelligent fashion it can bank switch out the 12K of firmware over here and load things like integer basic or whatever into RAM from a disk and execute it out of here. It was called a language card because you could actually load different languages into it. Uh, of course there was Fortran, there was something else but the main thing was there was a P system, the Pascal system which took over and uh, Pascal system had to use this because it had to take over the entire machine. Keep in mind that the I.O. space had to be maintained uh, for all of the uh, expansion cards, but for all intents and purposes you had a 64K machine to write your Pascal code in. And then of course Microsoft came out with the Z80 card or the CPM card, which was principally similar to this except it was a full Z80 computer that just used the keyboard and uh, display out of here. I think for two years in a row it was a best-selling product that Microsoft sold and it allowed you to run CPM software. CPM was written for small computers and really all you had to do when you used it on a, all the high-level code was contained in CPM. Of course you had to create the low-level drivers for the specific machine architecture you were running on. But uh, for the Apple CPM or Z80 card, all of that was supplied with the card. So all you had to do was plug in the Z80 card and start loading Z80 uh, and start loading CPM programs. One other difficulty was that the disk format, Apple's disk format was proprietary, ingenious but proprietary, and uh, CPM stuff, CPM, uh, the way it was delivered, couldn't talk to that. So essentially to get a CPM program to execute on an Apple, you had to get you had to transfer it to the Apple through a serial card from another computer. But once you had done all of that, you basically had a full CPM capable micro. And if you pulled the Z80 card out of it, it went back to the Apple again. And I forgot to mention, so why is do we have this ribbon cable? That's in order to enable the extra 16K over here all of the signals it needs are contained in this socket which is the first dynamic RAM. And here's a little more complete view of the inside. You can see the extra row of RAMs over here and uh, that pretty much sums up what the Apple does. So uh, does it live? Let's find out. So let's hook up a disk drive that I also got with the machine and it just plugs into the drive zero slot on the disk controller card 
Now this is a bit unfortunate because there's no shroud around it, there's no uh, no keys, nothing. And it's very easy to offset when you're plugging it in here to offset it by an entire row. If you do that, you will blow up a chip in the drive. Fortunately, that chip is uh, socketed. It's a it's an off-the-shelf TTL chip. But uh, I think a lot of people blew that chip up because it's it's very easy to misalign this plug. But now that's in. Run the cable through one of the back slots. And uh, we also need something to displace to display what's happening with the computer. I also got a monitor with this. Uh, the monitor 3 not to be confused with the Apple 3, it has nothing to do with that. This came out before. I guess they had a monitor 1, a 2. This just so happens to be a 3. <clears throat> now, this one is pretty yellow. Let me see if I turn on some more lights here. You can see the difference between the Apple itself. Kind of, not really. Yes, you can. So this is yellowed, which people blame on uh, bromine added to the, the plastic as a fire retardant and all of that, which means this is going to have to be retro brighted, but uh, we'll leave that for the future. Let's see if we can boot something. Turn this on. I have a mystery disk here. I better label this. So this is Donkey Kong. So obviously the machine lives. But in order to play Donkey Kong, we should probably get ourselves a joystick, which didn't come with the computer. So I had the computer and then I figured, you know, how expensive can it be to get, get a joystick for these things? There were gazillions made and should be cheap, but uh, that isn't the case. They're not, I mean, there's some on eBay, but uh, they're kind of pricey. Anyway, I looked around. I was patient for a week or two. I found one locally for $10 in near new shape. And... Uh, I can untangle it here. It's a two-axis analog joystick. And I was happy to get it. And uh, the box says it has a, a PC plug and an Apple plug. Except this plug is not for a 2 Plus. The 2 Plus needs a 16-pin header like this so uh, to plug this plugs into the motherboard so these joysticks were supposed to come with converters that plugged into here and then uh, converted this to a 16 pin dip header but uh, that converter wasn't included so since I wanted to play games and I wanted to test the joystick uh, I checked on eBay, they're available, but you know, at the time I checked they were coming from Hong Kong and it would take three years to arrive and I just got too impatient, so I built a converter. And so there's a DB9 soldered on one side and the wires just run to the proper pins on the 16 pin over here. And all we got to do is plug this into the 16-pin game connector inside the Apple. And then plug uh, this 
DB9 male into the female plug and everything should be hunky-dory. So let's plug this into the apple and see if we can play Donkey Kong at least. So here's the game connector, just a 16 pin socket. It was open and on above it it says game. And that goes into the ribbon cable. Which feeds into the uh, converter board over here. And then we plug the DB9 from the joystick in here. And hopefully we can play Donkey Kong with this. Alright. Let's tidy up first. Okay, let's see if we plugged in anything wrong. It's loading. One player. Oh, that is quite out of tune. I guess whoever programmed it was a good programmer, but uh, was lacking a musical ear. And whoever's playing this doesn't play very well. Let's see if I can at least get past the first screen. Not like that, I don't. Well, that sounded more in tune. hit the button. Honest. Anyway, by now you are probably wondering why am I playing this on a monochrome monitor? Well, that's because uh, I just wanted to make sure that this monitor still works, has a nice crisp display, but uh, and Donkey Kong is playable, but uh, there are some other games I've tried playing like, Bo like Boulder Dash and uh, Jumpman and they're virtually unplayable because you can't tell the objects apart. So let's drag out a color monitor and see how things look in color on the Apple. So here's the first color monitor composite I could grab. Let's see what it looks like. Ooh, actually doesn't look too bad in real life, but uh, the video looks completely oversaturated. Well, let's kill the brightness on it. Okay, the brightness is turned all the way down on this now. But you can see the color a little more, so yes, the apple does color. So let's see what the game looks like in color. Ah. 
Hmm, why are the beams blue? They're not supposed to be blue. Yeah, now they're green. It wasn't me, it wasn't me. The joystick messed up. killed myself. Anyway, there you go. Uh, that's what it looks like in color. Let me have a look and see if I can find anything else exciting in the disc box. Here we have a classic for the Apple. It did get ported to other games, but it first appeared on the Apple. Bandits. Shoot them up. Oh, you gotta sit through the intro. See, this is at this brightness settings it's easily readable in real life but it gets washed out so I gotta turn down the brightness here oh and this one this doesn't accept a joystick that's a shame I wonder Can't yeah, play this with the keyboard. See, it's non-continuous. Every time you hit the key, you move a certain distance, but you don't move continuously on it. Let's see. Does is there a way to select joystick here? Hmm. I'm sure there is a way to do this, but. Uh, See if it asks us, gives us a choice. Okay, let, let it scroll down the credits. And Maybe, uh, maybe I have to hit the J to start. Copyright 1982. No. I don't know. I can't get it started. Press spacebar to start. Yeah, I know that already. How do I get the how do I get the joystick to work? Demo mode. Sorry, I can't get the, I don't know how to get the joystick to work, but there you go. It is uh, the Apple's working. You have a pretty good idea now how uh, the architecture in it works. But uh, one final question you may have is how did I get all of the software onto the Apple? So when I got the Apple, it, got, it came with a few discs, but none of them worked. And so I was sitting there uh, with the machine booting into BASIC, which didn't do me a whole lot of good. 
And there's websites that have binary dumps of games that you can make discs out of, but uh, you need a super serial card in here, and then you need to hook it up to your PC through the serial port, and it'll generate discs, and it's all, all kind of involved, and generally I'm lazy when it comes to things like this, so I kept looking. And I found something really interesting that I'm going to share with you. So I found this website, the uh, the Apple II disk server it's called. Let's see, how do I show the URL? Oh, I just mouse over. So the uh, I'll put I'll put it into the comments. It's ASCIIexpress.net slash slash disk server. And uh, Apple Disk Server now with 1,566 disks. Now the interesting part about this is, great, you know, anybody can download disk images and that's no big deal, but how do you get it to the Apple? So what they do is you essentially hook up the sound output of the PC to the cassette input on the Apple and then it's fully automated. What you do is, and I'll show you on the Apple, you type in load, which tries to load something off cassette, and then you select something. I don't know, what is this? Yeah, Crossfire. And on the PC, you basically play back the audio file. Now, you have to have the audio cranked up all the way and I'm taking the headphone output from the PC to do this. It did not work with anything less than maximum uh, volume for me. But let's switch back to the uh, Apple screen and see how all of this works. So again, on this side, we are, we've selected Crossfire. And what I do is I use the uh, 8K FI format rather than the hi-fi format, and I usually let it format the disks too. But really, there's not much else you have to do other than take an audio cable and run it from your PC's headphone output into the cassette input on the Apple. And here's how it works. You do need a blank floppy disk, of course, because it dumps it writes it all to disk. So we put that in. I've plugged the headphone output of the PC into the cassette in on this. And now what we do is we type load, which is basically the command to load something off cassette. So it sits here and monitors the uh, cassette input. And then on the PC, I just go to the audio file of the product that I've selected and press the play button on it. And at first, there's... You get that beep. That means, okay, they're talking to each other right now. So it's loading InstaDisk. And what InstaDisk basically is, is it takes the data blocks it gets off of the website, decompresses them, and writes them to disk. The first thing it does is I choose the... Uh, let's see, which one did I choose? Oh, it's not going to work. No, it is going to work. I chose the right one. Uh, I choose the one that actually says format the disk before downloading anything. So it just downloaded this formatting program through the cassette port. Now it's loading the actual data and it conveniently tells you what's happening. So it's loading um, highly compressed data. This block takes 14 seconds. Once the 14 seconds have passed, it decompresses the data and then starts writing it to the disk. And uh, it will keep repeating this until it has downloaded an entire disk's worth of data, 
Well, uh, I mean, the data you really want, it'll pad the disk. But you basically got to sit through it, downloading the stuff, inflating it, and then writing the data. Okay, the download is finished. It says uh, press return to reboot, but what I found is it usually works better to power cycle the machine. And here's Crossfire. Oh! There's a whole bunch of games on here. Okay. Well, D for Crossfire. Prepare yourself. That was quick. All right, how do we get the joystick? Took the J. And is ignoring it. Come on, there's got to be a way to go to a joystick here. Same problem as before. Uh, it's using some sort of keyboard uh, assignment. Well, uh, maybe I can... Uh, there was another one in there that said uh, Crossfire Title Screen. Maybe that'll tell us how to get into the joystick mode. So, Crossfire Title, C. Geez, that takes longer to load than the game itself. Okay. I just want to hit a key because it'll start the game right away. Okay. Oh, it is a whole game, but with, with the title. So, it's not responding to the button. So, I don't know. Yeah, joystick doesn't work on this game. But, that's a pretty neat way uh, to get some software. If you pick up a 2 Plus and you have no discs, and you don't have a super serial card, and you don't want to be chasing after binaries and spending three days getting them properly on a disc, just so the discs get stored away for the rest of their lives, this is a really quick way to get some stuff and have a look at it. And uh, I applaud the ingenuity of the person who came up with this because I know that these programs are pretty small, but they still download pretty quickly. So hats off. And finally, I booted in uh, the RAM test disk, and we're going to select option three force test of two plus language card. So it's going to test the entire 64K. And that's number three. So, it's still loading. It's a lot of code it's loading here, but let's see what it does. Are you sure you want to do this? Mm, can any, let me know you guys if, if you can think of any reason why I should not be doing this. But let me know between, actually within the next two seconds. Okay, two seconds are over, nobody objected, so off we go. Okay, test passed. Is it still testing? Well, there you go. I guess uh, it tested everything. We passed. 
and uh, we're good to go. Oh, you hit menu, then you get uh, your system info, Apple 2 Plus, no extended 80 column card, and total RAM 64 kilobytes. You are right. Well, that's it, guys. Sorry I didn't, uh, we didn't find anything broken in here, so we could have repaired it, but uh, I thought it would still be useful for you to see how this machine how this machine worked, quick overview over the architecture of course, and uh, to actually see it run. It's kind of cute. So uh, please like, subscribe, and comment, and share, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one. Bonus footage, I couldn't help myself, there were just too many tempting programs on that website, so I'm probably going to spend the rest of the night playing games, but uh, as you can see, yeah, this one's a lot better implemented uh, than some of the other ones. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to use a joystick with this one either, but uh, at least the music doesn't sound flat, and there's lots more from where this came from. So if you have access to an Apple, Go out and have a good time.